years ago, I spent every day for over five months walking along the river searching for my brother's body who had committed suicide by drowning. This period of time, as you can imagine, was really traumatic and it was actually, it's actually really surreal to look back at it now with hindsight because um, I came from a busy career in London in human rights advocacy and then suddenly came home to Derry and I had nothing to do all day, every day, except to search along the river for his body. And it took us five months, but we did find him. He was washed up um, on a beach in Donegal. But because the life was very simple for those five months, I used to get up every morning, I would get the wellies on, I would have the raincoat on, and I'd just be walking. That was all I was doing. And it gave me a lot of time to think and to reflect. So during this period of reflection, I really began to think a lot about the lives of my brother and myself. We'd grown up in exactly the same family, but we'd had completely and utterly different paths in life. And I started thinking a lot about our childhood. It would have been a very tough childhood. We would have witnessed a lot of domestic violence. Um, even one of my first memories was a particularly serious incident on St. Patrick's Day, and I've never been able to enjoy St. Patrick's Day ever since. There would have been a lot of um, moving around every few months. We'd been moving house throughout our childhood. Um, we would have been quite socially excluded as well. In my brother's case, um, he would have been with very withdrawn. But in my case, um, I was really lucky. I got on to go to a, a grammar school. I got one of the I passed the, the national exam to go and, and study at a grammar school, but no one, none of the parents wanted their, their kids to be friends with me because I was from a really rough background. Um, and in terms of daily life, it would have been things like the electricity being cut off, you know, fending for food, things like that. So at the outset, looking at, looking at, at both our lives at, at that age, we, our, our lives would have been quite predestined, I suppose, you know, in, in terms of our upbringing. You, you probably could have predicted a path. But then we had very different paths after that. Um, he, he would have um, left school at 16. He was a really, really bright kid, really, really sparky and bright. But he would have, just because of the circumstances, no confidence, no adult ever believing in him. He would have left school with no qualifications. Um, and then he would have been unemployed for five years and, until he died. Whereas I was able to get educated, go off, study law, train in law. So we had really different paths. and. Thinking about it during this period, I wondered what was the key difference between myself and him. And as I saw it, the, the key variable was the fact that at his time of his death, he felt he had no choices in life, whereas I felt I had lots and lots and lots of choices. And then I thought, why, why did he have choice? Why did I have choices and he didn't have choices? And what I what I realised then was it was because of self belief. Um, even though the circumstances that I grew up in. Were, were very difficult. I always knew in my head, I always had a belief that my life was going to be completely different. I knew that that was going to drive me forward. Education was going to be the way that I was going to change my path in life. So I suppose when I first realised that I had this self-belief, I was 14 years old. Um, I was in school, as I said, I was very socially excluded. I was an odd kind of a kid. I would have been um, the typical nerd, always stuck in a corner with my head in a book. Um, and what I realised was I was terrible at sports, like absolutely appalling. You know, I wouldn't, I would have been miles and miles behind everyone else, all the athletic people. And I decided I was going to try and get good at sports. One sport, I was going to pick a sport, and I was going to get on the school team. So I thought I'll go for a nice solitary sport, so I don't have to worry about other people throwing the ball to me, like a netball or GA, because that's completely out of my hands whether I can get good at that or not. So I thought I'll go for a nice hard sport. I'll go for cross country running because I was really bad at that. So I decided I'm going to start training. I'm going to get on the school team. There were six spots on the team, and I was going to get one of those spots somehow. So I started training. And at the start, and for a very long time, I was still really terrible. So like the school that I was at, it was on a big, big hill. So at lunchtime, we'd all run the, 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 the team and the, the people, other people like myself trying to get on the team would do the training. And you'd begin up the hill and I would be miles and miles and miles behind everyone else. And I was actually sometimes hoping they'd overlap me so it would look as if I was just the, the same. And it was, you know, it was, it was really bad. I remember I used to get to the top of the hill and hide behind a bush so I could catch my breath before I started again because a lot of people will be sitting outside having their lunch on the grass and they could see you, so you were really, everyone could see, see you and see how bad you were in my case. 
And they even actually gave me an award um, w at the end of the year when they had the awards and everyone was getting all these great awards and, and you know, the athletic teams. They gave me one for gutsiness because I was so terrible, but I stuck at it. And, you know, they couldn't believe that I was still stuck at it. And I used to go out, I remember I used to go out training around the estate where I lived at half six in the morning because I wanted to get some extra training in. And I was absolutely petrified because I thought I'm going to be attacked because it's pitch black and I'm running around in the dark. But it was great, it was dark because no one could see how bad it was. But eventually, you know, I, I, I was still, I wasn't great, but I was getting a wee bit better. But I remember then one day the coach came to me and she said, look, one of the team has been injured. We've got a spot on the team. Do you want to be in the team? I was like, wow, yes, of course I want to be in the team, of course. So I got on the team and I was all delighted with myself. And eventually I got better and better. Um, but what I realized through that experience was it was actually that belief, that self-belief, which drove me forward and which, which enabled me to get better. And that actually translated into all the other areas of my life then. Um, I, I was a straight-A student and I ended up getting top marks in, in the country in the national exams and going off to do law and then going off to Brussels to work and then London. But it was actually that self-belief which, which I realized that made the, made the difference in, in my life that my brother didn't have. So following on from that, um, when my brother died, I founded an organization to work with young people who don't have um, as many choices in life, to try and work with them to instill in them self-belief so that they would have more choices in life. So we work with young people from backgrounds where there's zero employment in the family, where there's zero history of education attainment. Some of them are in the care system, some of them there might be addiction in the family um, or other issues. But that's the young people that we work with. And it does work and I've got so many hundreds of stories that I could tell about how instilling self-belief in these young people has enabled them to access education and choices and other opportunities. But I'm just gonna tell maybe a few today. So one of the young people that I work with um, at the start, I used to go around the schools asking for recommendations from the principals of young people who benefit from the programme. It's a highly intensive three-year programme. And I remember in one of the schools, she said, no one's interested in the programme at all except this one guy, but you, but you don't want him. You know, he's, we've no hope for him. He's, you don't want him. And when I actually got over my shock that, that this is what she was saying, um, I thought, this is exactly the kind of guy that, that we need to work with. Um, so we started working with him over a two or three year period, really intensively. And I'm now really pleased to say that he's actually um, in college at the moment, he's studying psychology. He was the first in his family to do his leaving cert. And he's also, he found, he's found his voice. Um, he's, really, um, he's really interested in the area of mental health um, as, as a result of his own experiences. And he's now a mental health advocate. He was only on the TV nationally last week. He does a lot of speaking at national conferences. He's always in the media and the radio and the newspapers. And it's, it's really ironic that, that the guy that the principal had no hope for is actually bringing hope to other young people in Ireland. Um, another example of a girl, um, she, um, when she first came with us, she had no confidence in herself. Um, she had lost both her parents when she was really young, three or four. They both died from drug addictions. Um, and her and her 13 um, brothers and sisters were all spread out through the care system and had no contact with each other. So when she first came to work with us, she had no aspirations. Um, she, some of her older siblings were actually living in the streets of Dublin, homeless. So she really thought, like, what can I do with my life? Um, and the hardest thing with her was actually identifying what her aspirations were. Um, but she realised that, that what she was really passionate about was the tourism industry. So I'm really pleased to say now she's actually pursuing further education in, in tourism management. So she's following her dream. But as I said, the hardest thing for her was actually identifying what that dream was. Another guy, um, when he started working with us, um, he didn't really know what he wanted to do either. Both his parents were on social welfare. He was thinking maybe I'll leave school and work in a factory or a shop or whatever. But we could see straight away he was really, really sharp. And we, we started kind of pursuing that with him and he realised he was really passionate about politics and law and, and governance. And we, pr we really encourage that in him. And I'm really pleased to say he's actually now in Trinity College doing law and politics, which is one of the hardest courses to get into in the country. And that was through pursuing a fee tech qualification, first of all. You know, there is these paths, it doesn't, it isn't always linear. And by doing a few other courses first, he was able to get into this course, which is amazing. And he's also a really strong interest in encouraging 
other young people to access education against the odds. He comes from an area where there's a lot of gang activity and violence and there's only 16% of young people in his area which um, are able to access further and higher education in 2016. So that's something he's really passionate about. He's, he does a lot of programs at the moment. He's involved in Trinity th with their access programs. And he's all about encouraging other young people um, to be able to access you know, these kind of opportunities. And then finally, just one more um, girl I'd like to talk about. Um, she, when she first joined the programme, she would have been very, very withdrawn. She would have been very quiet, her head down. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on in her family background, you know, you know as, as, as a result, kind of impacted on her confidence. Um, but what we found was that she was an incredible leader in the programme, and all the other young people would have really looked up to her. And so she would have... Again, not really what I uh, thought she was going to stay on. Her principal actually told me to take her because we were going to chuck her out of school if, if we didn't take her on our program. Um, so she, she wasn't really, think she never thought of herself in an educational mindset. She just thought, that's not for me. Um, but we encouraged her. She, was, she then became the first in her whole family to um, do the junior cert. She was the first in her whole family to do the leaving cert. And now she's actually pursuing further education um, in youth work. But the thing that really, um, that really sticks out for me about this, this young person was when she um, was uh, waiting on her leaving cert results um, last year, she did an interview on national radio and the presenter said, you know, how do you think you've done? Are you going to pass your exams? And she said, I don't know, I don't really think so, but you know what? It actually doesn't matter. She said, I'm going to be somebody anyway, regardless of whether I pass the exam this year. She said, I know that I'm going to be successful no matter what I do. She did pass her exams, which is brilliant. But it was that, it was that mentality that she now had. She had that complete self-belief in herself that she would get there no matter what. And so that's the idea that I wanted to share with you today, that if we can encourage our young people to have belief in themselves, they can go on and access other opportunities. Now, that might be education, but it's also about um, ensuring that they can be happy and successful in whatever, whatever they do. And by opening up these um, routes to them, they can make choices in life, which a lot of these young people don't have. Thank you. Thank you.